you wouldn't be the first person who compared these films or, you know, thought, accused maybe The Matrix of uh, using some ideas or... Yes, of course, of course. Uh, there are people coming for you even as we speak. You must not let them find you. They're coming for you, Neo, and I don't know what they're going to do. Mr. Murdoch. Mr. Anders. This could be a good candidate for, you know, creating a graphic novel from the film. This yeah, is yeah. good enough to be uh, adapted, frankly, as a comic book series. Yeah. That, you see it, what I'm it, saying? It, In other words, I, if you had a comic book series, maybe oh, yeah. giving them an idea. The Strangers, yeah. I'd buy that comic well, book. Well, after I saw the movie, I assumed it was adapted from a comic oh. book, and I was surprised when I looked up to find out that it is an original story. Exactly. Versus the other way around. You would like to see... They tried to figure out how they, where they came from. I didn't love Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, his his um, stammering accent thing mm -hmm. was kind of forced and over the top. You wouldn't appreciate that, would you, Mister? Whatever your name is. All right. Uh, welcome to the Avenue 54 Film Club review of Dark City, the director's cut. What up, Chris? What up, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> so we just watched this one on the projector. This is an Alex Proyas mm. joint. Proyas? Proyas. Proyas. Something like that. Oh yes, <laughs> I think that's what it was. Yeah, yeah I think he's. Uh, I think he's an Aussie, um, and he had done. To my knowledge, he came from doing music videos. Okay. And then he had done The Crow. Two years before this, I think it was. Wow. No, maybe ninety four. Yeah, but he had his only feature before this was The Crow. I think the cinematographer, um, Darius Wolski, mm -hmm. did The Crow with him also and crushed it on this thing. I mean, yeah. like, some really, some of the standout stuff in here is the photography, the set design, you know, cost the way they constructed this world is like ultra impressive. Like that, that's the shit that like really, really stands out to me. Yeah. And Wol Wolski, I think went on to do all kinds of big shit. He did like all the, um, Pirates of the Caribbean movies mm -hmm. and he did like the second Sicario. I think it was before this, he did Crimson Tide, the Solid Flick. Su submarine movie. Solid yeah. Flick, Denzel. Yeah. Gene yeah. Hackman. Gene Hackman. Yeah. With Tony Scott. Mm. And then he went on to do all the alien reboot movie. He did Prometheus. I think he did Prometheus and Covenant. He did cinematography for that. Yeah. Nice. So he's a beast. He Very he, much so. All that, <laughs> all that you just <laughs> dropped right there was like brand new to me. I, yeah. I'm not really familiar with the names of the people behind the scene in that sense. Uh, this was one of the best movies that I didn't remember. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's one of those great movies you forget about. I huh? totally forgot about it. So when you popped it up and said, yo, this is it. We're going to watch this one. And I was like, you know what? I haven't seen that movie in years. And it yeah. Be yeah. Fresh to all of everything that comes with it. So. It yeah. was really cool. It it's really kind of cool. a sleeper. I mean, that's, I mean, kind of. It's at this point, it's like a cult, it classic. Is a cult classic. I don't think, I don't think it did so well when it originally came out. I think most people saw it because of the DVD. You know, I don't think they saw it theatrically, because I literally, I got sick of it, and I still hear it to this day. I got sick of people coming up to me and saying, "Was this film ever released theatrically? Why didn't I know about it?" And and these are people who absolutely love the film. It was on New Line. Mm -hmm. But I think I think the crow did really well. Did great, which With is Brandon Lee. It did great. Yeah, Shout out basically. to Bruce's son. 
Brandon Lee, rest in peace as well. Who, who died in some way filming that movie. Dad. But I think that's where, you know, Alex Proyas, like, got the juice to yeah. get this going. Because to my understanding, this was like, this was a <clears throat> film that he wrote in film school Mm -hmm. and like, you know, wanted to get going. I think he wrote it like in the early, early nineties, like 90, 91. And then, um, he brought on someone to help him with the screenplay. This dude, uh, David Goyer, Mm -hmm. I think is the guy's name. And that dude goes on to, he wrote all the blade movies and then he wrote, and then he wrote the story. I think he wrote the screenplay for Batman Begins, and Come then he on. wrote the story for Dark Knight. Come on! So man. like the the foundation of it. Those it, are yeah some of the best yeah comic book movies that were put out. You know, especially the Blade series. These think, guys are beasts, and yeah, it seems like they kind of you know were getting just getting going. Um, all these guys, the director. Yeah. Um, the cinematographer and the writer, you know, right around this time. I think just the work that they did on the crow of the world building and the tone of mm-hmm. the movie. But it's really impressive that, like, the because the crow was came from a comic book, exactly, and so it was IP. You know, it was a story that was already there, mm-hmm. and this is totally original story you know, originally developed by the director. Mm -hmm. So to like come off of something that already existed, build a world really well. And quite frankly, it could have been a fucking comic. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You had your superhero and then you had obviously the villains. Right. And the story could have continued. Yeah. This could, this could have had sequels for sure. I don't know exactly why that didn't happen or if anybody attempted to do that, but this, this could be a good candidate for, you know, creating a graphic novel from the film. This is good enough to be uh, adapted, frankly, as a comic book series. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? In other words, if you had a comic book series, maybe giving them an idea, the strangers, I'd buy that comic book. Well, after I saw the movie, I assumed it was adapted from a comic book, and I was surprised when I looked up to find out that it is an original story. Exactly. Versus the other way around. You would like to see they tried to figure out how they, where they came from. They do such a good job of immersing you in this world that almost, it almost feels cartoonish, but it's, Mm -hmm. it's so gritty and has this weird, um, realness to the environment like this this weird natural element to it my approach to the whole thing was just let's light it in the most it might sound funny but it's absolutely true let's light it like in the most like naturalistic way so what i've used in the streets with built practical lights which of course, shapes of it is very stylized and that kind of fits the whole look of the movie, but sources were actually sodium vapor lights, which you use right now on every street. Yeah. Even though it's so almost comic book-ish and that it it's like set in a time that doesn't really exist, like it's yeah. sort of based on based 1940s on kind of. It should be. Yeah, they're like art deco buildings, yeah. but the music's kind of modern and you know, the, the cars are maybe forties, thirties mix in between. <laughs> yeah. The strangers built the city based on our, on our memory. And so it's some weird retro world that they kind of fabricated and it's a mixture of stuff, you know? So you do get a very odd mix of, 40s, 50s, 60s, and probably even 70s in there. But I don't think a time's ever defined. Exactly. And the influence of of film noir, like, so heavily in this, mm. combining what is basically a comic book noir world into a alien science fiction story. It is strictly a comic book. <laughs> they do. Like, you can't even deny that it belongs on paperback, you know, so. Yeah, I agree. In the vein of some Frank Miller graphic novel stuff. Yeah, it's exactly. like, it, it's it's that level. We didn't even really do a synopsis. You know, um, guy wakes up with amnesia. True. Um, 
to in a hotel room in a bathtub in a hotel room with a dead body with swirled blood marks on her body <laughs> and has to scramble to figure out who he is. And um, there's some very strange, tall, you know, Nordic whites. <laughs> in, With in, trench coats in, and tra- top hats yeah, and shit. trench coats and top hats <laughs> that show up right as he's fleeing yeah, the scene. Basically looking like vampires. Yeah, yeah. And then we learn that our guy, uh, Rufus, John Murdoch, is suspected of being a serial killer. Yes. And he, because he has amnesia, he doesn't even know if that's true, um, but has a feeling that it's not. In the noir story fashion... He goes on a, a long journey of twists and turns to unravel what happened to him, who he is, and what's really going on, and who set him up. But the twist for me was understanding all the other things that were surrounding him that was like, hey, I don't know who I am, but this shit shouldn't be happening. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Motherfucker shouldn't be just falling asleep all of a sudden, you know what I mean? Like. Yeah. Yeah, we quickly find <laughs> out that uh, the world is not what it seems. Yeah, exactly. And, and I like the acting. Um, there were some scenes where it was like, okay, cartoonish or whatnot. Uh, kind of went on some TV, old TV land show stuff. But yeah. for the most part, the acting was good. There was a good cast. You had William Hurt. You had Jennifer Connelly. Yeah. Uh, Rufus Sewell. Yeah. I uh, actually looked him up just to, because I was like, well, I've seen this guy before. He's been in other stuff, but he's I don't really stuff. know him from anything else. Like, so he's he's that guy in some stuff. The most recent stuff. thing he's done outside of this 2023 movie that I have no, no idea about, it's like Depiction or something like that, uh-huh. is, called, is Old. He's in the M. Night Shyamalan movie, Old. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't see that. Oh, you didn't? Mm-hmm. That's actually one of his... You know, better movies. Is off it? The, off the down trail he went to. But yeah, it's it's kind of a good upcoming movie for him in particular, saying like, okay, I made a comeback mm-hmm. and created something that people can watch again. And it was really solid. It was yeah. a solid flick. But he's been in Zorro and he's been in a couple of other things. So uh, yeah, he, he has been around and I guess he's still uh, acting to this day. Uh, this is probably one of the few lead man roles. True. Um, and I think I think he did a great job. He does have like a really signature look. And he has those like eyes that pop out of his yeah. head. It's like Julius Caesar or some shit. He, he has an odd look. Um, that's, I don't know, it's odd in a way. Sort of like how, like Joaquin Phoenix. That's odd, what I was going to say. That's know? why I said Julius Caesar. I don't know. I was thinking of fucking... <laughs> Uh, what's that flick with Russell Crowe? Gladiator. Pro? Yeah, yeah. So like, okay, yeah, you look Roman and shit. <laughs> um, I so I liked him. I thought Jennifer Connelly was really good, mm-hmm. um, and I thought William Hurt was excellent. Yes, <sighs> I didn't love Kiefer Sutherland. Uh, his his um, stammering accent thing mm-hmm. was kind of forced and over the top, and kind of took me out of it a lot. There is no ocean, John. The only place home exists is in your head. Mr. Buck. Maybe he's a step up the evolutionary ladder. A a freak of nature. He's adapting to survive. You were waiting for that moment. Yeah, because when we, before we started the movie, yeah, I said I like good actors that play Weasley characters. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I do think Kiefer Sutherland's a good actor. I like him in a lot of stuff. And I think he came off of playing bad guys in a couple things. Yeah. He was, he had like just done that weird freeway movie okay, where yeah. he was the killer. Exactly. And then I forget what, I, there was something else where he had just played a bad guy. And he's, you know, kind of a bad guy, kind of not, you know, he's almost like a MK Ultra doctor or yeah. something in this, but ends up assisting our protagonist in yeah. his journey to, uh, you know, 
to solve the big problem that he has in the film. I first saw this movie because I took a, I took a class at Valley College, a philosophy class, and they had us watch this movie. Oh wow, that's yeah. deep. Yeah, I don't remember what the exact. I, I guess it was like that we were discussing existentialism, and they were you know uh, using this as sort of like a jumping off point mm-hmm. for like what is life and what makes you a human in order to learn learn what about you mr murdoch you and your fellow inhabitants what makes you human why and that sort of thing so i mean there's really deep concepts going on in this movie and it is true that seems to be a thing for the director for alex price because he the Big films that he did after this were iRobot. Oh, hell no. And then he did Knowing, um, that Nicolas Cage one. Are we going to die? I will never let that happen. Yeah, I never watched that one. It always pops across it's my not, timeline, but I've never watched it. It's not one. terrible. It's also like one of these high concept movies where okay. like the uh, in my opinion maybe the execution's not great, but okay. that he seems to be attracted to these really high concept science fiction stories. Mhm. And, you know, I Robot is that for sure. True. And then maybe fall short a bit on the execution but i don't i don't really dislike either of them they're just maybe not great (laughs) yeah (laughs) this is you know right around the time i think the same year as like the truman show true this is um you know maybe the year of or the year before the 13th floor which is another um, science fiction film that explores this kind of yeah, uh, concept, <laughs> and then um, the Matrix, obviously. Obviously, the Matrix has a lot of feel on that one too. Yeah, so <laughs> you know, I mean, the Matrix came out in '99. This came out in '98. Um, you know, I'd imagine the Matrix was probably in production. Mm-hmm. You know, around by by the time. Yeah, let's use the aliens to be sentience on the Matrix. <laughs> well, he's the. I mean, I'm just saying, I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you wouldn't. Very be, similar looking uh, entities there. You wouldn't be the first person who compared these films or you know, thought accused maybe the matrix of, uh, using some ideas or, yes, of course, of course. uh, There are people coming for you, even as we speak. You must not let them fight you. They're coming for you, Neo, and I don't know what they're going to do. You must leave now. What is there? Go now. No major because a story about Jesus and shit, but that's a whole different story. Well, John Murdoch, <laughs> J- John Murdoch is the one in this film. Exactly. So it could and be Jesus too. Yeah. So he, sure, <laughs> I I, I, de- I definitely think that like when he was when Alex Price was writing this, he must have been 
using allegories and like yeah. you know old mythology for sure to put this together yeah. and so like that's very pervasive in the story um, i think anyone that creates any super character of that to that nature uses jesus as his platform also we watched the director's cut i think that the original version if i'm not mistaken has narration Oh, wow. at, at least narration in the opening and then some in the end, maybe. Oh, okay. So they um, went full noir. Yeah, and I think by Kiefer Sutherland. Oh, um, I got you. I think, um, I think I saw something from Alex Proyas like saying, like Blade Runner, the studio forced him to do it. Oh, okay. that like he didn't he didn't want the narration, but they thought American audiences are stupid and <laughs> they need they need some more explanation. And that and it may be true. Some people um, can't sit there and watch a movie mm-hmm. that they have to actually think about. It it does have a complex plot. Yeah, um, they hold the mystery up really well until they start revealing things, explaining what's going on. Mm-hmm. You know, when you first see them put everybody to sleep and come switch people around and change the environment and all this stuff, the way that they did it with these models, I think Mm -hmm. it must be with models. Yeah. The way they twisted and built these buildings for like, you know, early days of CG. Groundbreaking. Yeah. Groundbreaking. They, they, it looked so good. Um, I mean, so, look, I'd say like half of the VFX in this movie are really, really great and work really well. And then half of them are just really terrible. Yeah. <laughs> they, they were dealing with what they had back then. So, yeah, I do I, think I, I, also they had a limited budget. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, um, and the, you know, everybody falling asleep and him first realizing that everybody's in the whole town is asleep is like very reminiscent of a Twilight Zone episode True. or something. Come on. But the way they do it, the way they shoot it, is pretty incredible. And the ending. And not to jump, but the ending was all right. All right, I like. It's I very like descriptive. It. Yeah, I just didn't want to spoil the ending in general, so yeah. I was like, okay, the ending was for me very solid. It's a feel good ending. Yeah, they, uh, it does have a happy ending. Yeah. They um, they do the conspiracy theorist uh, tropes. True. Of the ex detective uh, who, partner who's gone crazy, exactly. And, yeah. and, you know he's drawn all over the walls, <laughs> and he has the. He's the, been seeing visions. He's, he's put, got he, visions. He's putting together the conspiracy, and he has scattered papers and yarn <laughs> tying them together and things. You know, like like the classic uh, conspiracy theorist. Nothing like a little healthy paranoia. Oh my and God. that actor plays out really well. He um, does, he does. There is no case. There never was. It's all just a big joke. It's a joke. It does feel a bit to me like once we get to the third act and they're really trying to wrap everything up, um, that it feels a little bit rushed and the pacing towards the end mm-hmm. isn't as 
clean and doesn't flow as good as the first and second act do. Um, it just it just feels like either they didn't have it fully thought through when they wrote it originally, or they made changes to the script at the end. Um, maybe it was studio pressure to change some things. I don't know, but it it definitely you know first half of the movie and then maybe a little past that i'm just like i wouldn't touch a thing mm. and then to, into the third act i feel like they just start kind of rushing the plot in ways that don't feel like they flow the same way the rest of the the beginning of the film did and okay. um i can see that didn't mention how cool the fucking aliens are so again i mean that's back to the stuff i said about set design yes and exactly. costume work the way that the creatures are designed the creatures who are who have inhabited uh, spoilers again spoilers <laughs> spoilers the creatures who have inhabited human bodies um as they explain to us that they've taken the corpses Yes. And climbed into their bodies and we get to see them a couple times where there are these like jellyfishy kind of, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know, like uh, yeah. spider something. Octopus, <laughs> octopus yeah. tie. Or, yeah. <laughs> it kind of looks similar to the aliens in To Live and Die in L.A. To Live and Die in L.A. Uh, no, not there's what, no what, aliens no, not that to one. live and die in LA. What, what, what was the one we watched with the aliens? The one we just watched? Yes, the older. The play. Hidden. Oh, The Hidden. That's what I'm saying. It, they did They did kind of, they that, kind of yeah, had that, 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 that look movie. and that yeah. body of that type of alien. And also had, the, like, again, back to the Matrix, the uh, the Sentinel look. Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. ones that would attack, attack the ships and whatnot. Yeah, they're kind of, they're jellyfishy yeah. spider spider things. things. <laughs> and they climb out of the heads when they bust open. Yes. They... I do like when they do the violence, they don't have like a lot of gory violence, but when they do it, they do like, it's really dark red Man. blood, and it splatters all over yeah, the place. It's pretty brutal, though. It's, <laughs> like you said, it's not gory or just gratuitous, but it's pretty mm -hmm. brutal when it happens. So, like, the head getting chopped off from the back and crushed by the building. Yeah. Those are pretty brutal endings. <laughs> yeah, but I do. I, I, yeah, and I like it kind of goes with the look of everything. Exactly. Being sort of comic bookish, where it's, like, almost satire the amount of like blood that's squirting yeah. out is like too much <laughs> yeah, but it's great it's great i'm talking tarantino it. but no, not not pretty... not that level <laughs> but yeah it is it is in that direction yeah it's definitely in that direction yeah. you know um so yeah but the aliens and their world um that they've built underneath the city is so fucking cool right and uh the way they have them in the circular, you know, um, arena style uh, meeting oh, room, yeah. and then and the way it's all lit in there with with their you know pale skin and this like high contrast lighting everywhere. do the um the the giant like alien face that opens up to the mm -hmm. clock that stops time and puts everybody to sleep exactly. while they're all tuning together that that shit looks so fucking cool i've never seen anything like it it's it's amazing and shut it down actually have a mind blower for you what you got when he brought her into the room uh, when he brought Jennifer Connelly the doctor brought her to the room mm -hmm. and that was their first meeting he had the rats in the maze right 
And he was like, she's like, what are you doing? He's actually, it's actually cruel uh -huh. what we're doing here. Yeah. But it's an experiment. Uh -huh. And he just kept saying that. But when you look at the world that they were in. Yeah. That, well, you're not blowing my mind. I, yes, I noticed that, the, that it was a amazed. design of the, of the world that it's we were amazed. in. It's a maze. It yeah. just changes. The whole thing's a circle. And exactly. then he, he, and then the patterns that they're um, killing the girls with are yeah, the, the circles. circles. And then that's what the cop who's losing his mind is drawing He's on the drawing walls, the all these spirals. Exactly. And then John's fingerprint. Yeah, I, I picked okay. up on that. I'm yeah. just, I, I didn't know if you picked that up because <laughs> yeah. you didn't mention it. So I was like, hey, maybe that's something Bob didn't see. Uh, but yeah. No, I, it's I, a good, it's a great call out. There's little nuanced things that I like a lot where, you know, to explain that the William Hurt detective character does not miss anything. Mm -hmm. He tells the, you know, rookie cadet, Tie your, shoes. Tie, your lace is untied. Mm -hmm. And then when he, he's starting to get confused and he doesn't really know if his worldview is correct anymore or if he mm -hmm. has a grasp on this that same cadet yeah, points at his shoe being untied he just kind of shrugs it off and like yep it's <laughs> not you know it's not the most subtle yeah. but it's it's a nice little touch but i do think the final battle is is pretty rough yeah it's on, pretty the, rough. on the graphics pretty rough on the graphics yeah uh, however i do like to point out the aliens mm-hmm Fucking horrible fighters, bro. Like, they were horrible <laughs> fighters. Like. That's a good point. Yeah. It's like these motherfuckers, they supposed to be controlling shit, and I think anybody could have killed them if they was fighting anybody on the one on one set. It was just like, unless they were tuning or tuning or whatever the fuck you want to call it, they had nothing. Like, they had no hand to hand combat skills whatsoever. It's true. I so I don't I think there was a <laughs> there was a, a varying degree of power that they had. Okay. Like some of them could levitate, some of them could um had telekinesis and could move things. Okay. Um okay. they all seem to be able to b make people go to sleep. Yeah, but, but none of them can fight. Like none of them. Well, I, I, <laughs> yeah, this is true. You're hundred percent correct. <laughs> They were not good at fighting, and their weapon of choice was a dagger. It is it. You know, was a, was a little blade. Um, when it seems like you just have guns or yeah. something. Because you know? William Hurt put about <clears throat> four of them down. <laughs> right, yeah, and now that, that's where it became evident. You were like, "Why do you guys have these little daggers the when you know working? that some of these people have yeah. guns? Can like, you, you gave them the guns with your June motherfucker. <laughs> Can you stop the bullets? They coming to you. And yeah. That was kind of weird to me that they had no real fighting skills. Most aliens or yeah. enemies, uh, villains or whatever it may be, they could fucking fight. You know, what I mean, they put. It. They're formidable opponents, but these motherfuckers was just like laydowns. Uh, so in <laughs> in the film's defense, I think they probably had never. It seems like John Murdoch was the first one that could fight back. That every once in a while there was a one off where somebody woke up during the sleep period, the rearrangement periods. Yeah, but they uh, weren't the one. But they never had to fight uh, any of these people. Uh, in the film's defense, you know, True. they, no. they do kind You're of right. explain the story that way. So, but it is a little bit silly that they would choose, uh, you know, a backup weapon of some sort. Um, and it would be this little dagger and they'd all have <laughs> one and they all look the same. <laughs> and, you know, except that, you know, it does seem like at least one of them, at least like Mr. Hand or whatever. Yeah. He, enjoy he was like getting off on serial oh, killing, killing these people, girls yeah. and then putting those <laughs> memories so i don't know i mean may, they they did seem a little like bloodlusty that like maybe they dug yeah, cutting people yeah i yeah, I guess so yeah, and yeah. and if you're in full control of the society you took you basically abducted thousands of people true built a city in space and you know you can put them to sleep anytime you want and they have no idea what world they live in um, you're probably not too worried about people fighting, you, fighting back. You know, yeah, that's true. <laughs> these are sort of the problems with these, the one movies. Mm -hmm. and, like if you're all powerful, like there's no reason anybody's fighting anybody. That's you true. know, it's like 
Captain Marvel showing up on the scene and she could just fucking <laughs> just destroy destroy everything, everything in two seconds. It's, it's like, like Thanos. Nah, yeah, ain't it's like that why is she shit, not time. destroying everything right <laughs> yeah, on the like, regular yeah. basis? <laughs> Uh, but so, yeah. but you know, they, right. they also do right. some story development stuff to, to work with that, where he has to, he has to learn. He's waking up with amnesia. He doesn't know how these powers work. You, you know, he, he doesn't have them develop, but it's also one of the problems I have with the rush tie up at the end yeah. is like, so Kiefer Sutherland, Dr. Um, I was Schnabel or yeah, something. Schnabel I, I, I forget like Schnabel. Something or something. Like that. <laughs> Schnabel. Um, <laughs> he, so he's he's a geneticist or whatever, and he can like create memories in mm-hmm. like a fucking test tube or whatever. And he's like, show, you know, a dash of childhood trauma, a little bit of broken heart, and uh, you know, putting these memories together. A touch of unhappy childhood. Ah, a dash of teenage rebellion. And last but not least, a tragic death in the family. And then his, like, secret weapon at the end to, like, give John the ability to fight them is him not just, like, finding where memories are stored in the brain and then figuring out which ones are which and then putting them all together, which is pretty fancy, you know, medical technology. But, okay, we'll go there. (laughs) But what he does with John is he, he gets so specific in his ability to create a memory that he inserts himself as all kinds of different people throughout John's life Mm -hmm. and also is able to in a, with a syringe in some sort of liquid chemical (laughs) alchemical process, he's able to get that so specific that he can actually change the words that he says. And now we're on some Harry Potter (laughs) shit. (laughs) Are we dealing with spells and shit? I, I know that we're not, we're not in a, you know, we're not in this world. We're in a different world. True. This is a science fiction world where aliens exist and there's human, you know, slave colonies in the middle of space floating around. So I'm not trying to get too nitpicky yeah, on like, I, I you know, it. what's possible in this world. But they were showing the process of him like mixing these liquids to create the memories. I'm like, wow, well, the fuck are you going to yeah. make your... Put, put yourself in those memories and have Again, you say all these specific things to teach him how to be the one. We go to the Harry Potter theory. <laughs> it's the concept that's cool. I uh, see. Um, oh, all right. So to yeah. even add himself in the memories like that and making him be his teacher through these memories in his life to show him the way. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I wasn't really shitting on it, but I think, I understand where you're coming from because it does sound even more far fetched when you explain <laughs> it that way. I think so. It was like shit. Yeah, I'm thinking Harry Potter at this point. I think if they would have showed the technology of like how he created the memories in some sort of different way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I might have. I might have. Yeah. Shit. That's what I mean. Like <laughs> some electricity yeah, exactly, flowing through this world. Exactly. Like, like, Give me some machines. Like, <laughs> you know, and that could have worked really well in this world too. Like True. this was True. like a Terry Gilliam, like Brazil <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, um, Holy shit, 12 you monkey. money python. <laughs> yeah, like uh, Terry Gilliam does those worlds with this like industrial design yeah. that's real similar to this. So like that's having true. having some sort of weird um, machine that created the memories maybe it been maybe would have like worked that. better yeah. for me, you know. But j- you know, <laughs> it's it's kind of easy for me to make these suggestions twenty five years exactly. later. Exactly. You know? yeah. like, Again, that's why you got to do the sequel. Like they innovated a, a ton of techniques here and they created a world in such an amazingly beautiful way i think most of the acting was great um the what i'm desperately in love with in this movie is the world building set design the concept of the story is so great i think so good they deliver on it it 
it's a little underdeveloped in the closeout of the story. Okay. The opening of it, I think, is perfect, but I just, I just feel like it gets rushed at the end, mm -hmm. and I think they could have had Kiefer Sutherland speak. I don't know. They could have changed his dialect a little bit, and I think the character would have. He's just like this constant out of breath, out of breath. thing, and I can't. <laughs> And it's just the same over and it's over true. and over. I, and it's I'm like, not going to lie. It's, it's like, true. you didn't need to do that to you, buddy. You wouldn't appreciate that, would you, Mr. Whatever Your Name Is? O overall, um, let's see. So we're doing the five-star rating. This is, this is a four-star film for me. Oh, wow. That's pretty deep. But we don't do halves or quarters. You can so. do halves. Yeah. <laughs> you can do a quarter if you want. I didn't remember it. Uh, so it was almost watching a brand new movie for me. Nice. Um, yeah. There were pieces that did spark some memory, but it wasn't enough for me to be like, know what's going on next. Yeah. I kind of dig everything about it. Uh, the ending for me wasn't so rushed, but that's because I had engulfed myself in this comic book world. Yeah. Being a kid that grew up reading comics on a regular basis and, you know, follow all that shit to this day, yeah. almost 50 years old. Uh, so I was locked in to just basically watching a comic. And I gave it, I'll give it four stars too. Nice. I'll definitely give it four stars. Uh, Hell yeah. Obviously it was some hit and miss moments, so that's why I wasn't able to give it five. I, I give it that fifth star for, you know, um extreme creativity originality i i that fifth star is there i'm just like losing you know a quarter yeah on, that's why i didn't get acting it, yeah, a quarter on misses. the story because it's rushed at the end exactly the you know misses. and some of the vfx suck Definitely you know? fucking so miss. that's why i'm i'm <laughs> at the end at least i that's mm -hmm. where my four stars come from yeah. it's like i'm not at a whole star for some of those exactly so i gotta be wild throughout the whole fucking movie before i give it five you know what i'm mm -hmm. saying um, but yeah, the Avenue 54 Film Club does highly recommend that you watch Dark City. It's been Church. A, yes, it's mm -hmm. been a while since I saw it, and I probably mostly have seen the theatrical cut. So I think this, <clears throat> I got a Blu-ray for us to watch this one tonight um, that had the director's cut on it. Nice. So this might be the first time I've seen that version. I loved it, um, you know. I, I can't call out exactly what the differences are, but I think maybe there's some extended scenes. I do think that the narration is in the theatrical cut and removed from this one. Mm -hmm. uh, so if that bothers you at all and you're rewatching, then you might want to go with the director's, the director's cut. cut. Please. But yes, watch Dark City and Facts. then watch it again and then watch it again. A lot of cool, deep philosophical concepts in here and it is just visually stunning. And Alex P, let's 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 work on that sequel. <laughs> let's, let's work on the sequel. I need to take that space station and find where they come from. I, 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 I would I, definitely... I would love to see that. I would I would go to the theater for a dark yeah, scene. Yeah, we're there easily. I, I could go for a prequel. I mean, yeah. Something. Yeah, I could Just, get back into yeah, this world. Let me get a little more in that world. All right. Um, like and subscribe or some shit. Thank you for watching. Bong, bong. <laughs> And I was surprised when I looked up to find out that it is an original story because it has mm -hmm. those graphics, the tilt shots, yeah. the forced perspective, yeah. uh, the strange swooping movements, and yeah. it's just alive. It's like, this is the movie, this is the direction Batman ought to be moving in. Well, frankly. sure. Well, yeah. I mean, that's a, we've, that's a dead series. You're right. Give him the next one. Um, There's an idea. Give Alex Proyas the next Batman movie and save the series. I've had two ideas. Coming up next.